This is going to hopefully start a weekly study I want to do that will be called Fighting the Famine. And Amos 8.11 says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. So I want these studies to be what you would consider fighting the famine. I want you to be able to have a place to go to and get a full meal, a complete buffet. I want to lay out the table and you can just come sop it all up. This, along with the other stuff I do, maybe it'll give you some good stuff to ponder on through the week. And right now I'm going to do a series of studies, Lord willing, on Bible villains. To show you who the true hero is, you got to have villains. And the Bible's full of them. And at the same time, I want to give you a balanced meal here. So I'm going to be looking at Genesis chapter 4 for the first villain, which is Cain. And also go over the three applications for his story. Now, if, you don't, if you're not familiar with the three applications of the Bible, let me share them with you real quick. You got the historical application. Pretty much what this means is everything in the Bible literally took place in history. It's a real story. It's not made up. It's not fantasy. But you see, many men reject the historical account of the Bible. They think it's too silly or too far-fetched to believe, so they say it's not real history. You know, a guy said to me one time that, don't you think the stories of the Bible are a bit embellished? And then a guy said to me one time, he said, you know, we don't know which parts of the Bible are completely accurate because it, it got tainted through so many years of copying and people adding certain things in and things like that. And then I've even heard, you know, people who have a lot of respect among people like Bill O'Reilly. Uh, he thinks that the, the Bible teaches some good moral things, but the stories are just fantasy. He doesn't believe that it's actually factual stories so they deny the historical application they deny that the stories actually set that are actually in the bible actually took place but the historical application is just simply looking at it and believing it as history that's the historical application it literally took place in history and you don't want to deny the historical application because when you do it messes with your hope you see, in Romans fifteen four, it says, "For whatsoever things were, what for whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the Scriptures might have hope." You see, if it's just fantasy, then it's no different than watching an inspirational movie. If it's all fantasy, then how can the Scriptures give hope in a life that isn't fantasy? Now, the next application is the practical application. And a lot of people neglect this one as well. But the, this application makes it relatable to you. This application is what helps your walk. Um, it's what helps you relate to the scriptures. A lot of men focus simply on the historical application or the doctrinal. And then that makes it a little bit dry sometimes. If you neglect this application, then it would be like reading history books at school. It, it would be just history but you're not really applying it to yourself practically. The Bible isn't just a history book, it's also a practical book. When you look at the practical application, you can look at a story in the Bible and think to yourself, what can I get out of this for me? How can I look at this for my life today? So that's what you look at when you look at the practical. But then you got the doctrinal, or also called prophetical. Whereas, you know, the practical is also referred to many times as the inspirational or devotional. You've got the doctrinal that's also referred to sometimes as prophetical. And this is the most neglected and is what makes the Bible come alive. This application, it's my favorite. And many times you see the doctrinal application and it, it makes the Bible come alive to you. And it's the most neglected one. And it's the one that most people don't realize that they don't know about they don't know how to look at the bible doctrinally and doctrine has become a thing of the past but 
the doctrinal application is the one that we're going to focus on today. And when you look at Bible typology, you're looking at the doctrine. When you examine the types, you're looking at the Bible from a doctrinal aspect and not just a historical or practical aspect. We're going to try to look at all three, but mainly we really want to focus on that doctrinal. Now, with this story in Genesis chapter 4, you got the story of Cain and Abel. Now, historically, what's the historical application? Historically, Cain it brings the fruit of the ground as an offering to the Lord, and Abel brings a bloody animal sacrifice. What happens? Cain gets jealous. Not jealous, but envious. He kills Abel, and that's the historical application. Then practically, we can look at this and say, you know, murder comes from the heart. It started in uh, Abel and Cain's heart. We don't want to hold uh, hatred in our heart towards anybody, towards our brother. If you hate your brother, that's the first step to the action. See, you can get that practical application right out of this chapter. And you see, the, the New Testament gives you the principles... And the Old Testament gives you the stories that illustrates those principles. The verse for this in the New Testament is 1 John 3, 15. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer. You see, it starts in your heart. You see, it's not, real, it's not murder if you kill somebody in war, you see. That's not murder because it's not premeditated. You know, you, you didn't, it's not premeditated murder. You're not killing them because you hated the person. Or, for example, uh, killing someone in self-defense. It's not premeditated. You didn't hate that person in your heart and go about to kill that person. But that's what Cain did, our first villain. Also, we, think, we see things like how God is no respecter of persons. Each and every one of us has an equal opportunity. For example, look at Genesis 4, 6 through 7. It says, And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth, and why is thy countenance fallen? If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted, and if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. You know, I can look at this and take comfort in the fact that God is no respecter of persons. He's going to still allow Cain to bring the correct offering. Uh, he doesn't have to just stay like he is. He can bring the correct offering. And I get comfort out of that, that God's no respecter of persons. He wasn't just respecting Abel over Cain. Now the doctrinal or prophetical application. It has to do with the fact that Cain is a type of the Antichrist. And this story pictures the killing of the saints in the tribulation. That's the doctrinal or prophetical application of this. And with that being said, I want to go over the similarities between Cain and the Antichrist. The first one is, Cain is, a, Cain is mistaken as a man from the Lord. Look at Genesis chapter 4 and verse 1. It says, And Adam knew Eve his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain, and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. So Eve thought Cain was the promised one. You know, in Genesis 3.15, the Lord talked about that promised seed. And Eve thought, wow, I've got, I've got him. I've got a man from the Lord. That's just like the Antichrist. You see, the world will believe that when the Antichrist shows up, that he is the one, that he is the man from the Lord, the one that's going to solve all the world's problems. If you look at Revelation 13.3-4, Talking about the Antichrist, it says, And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast, and they worshipped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast, and who is able to make war with him? Look at those words they say to him. They, not only do they worship him, but they say, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? You know, they think this is the one that's solving their problems. And I mean, this is takes place in the middle of the tribulation here. But even when he comes in, the Bible, when he comes in first on the scene, the Bible says he comes in peaceably. And he's going to obtain the kingdom by flatteries. You see, they think that the Antichrist is, is 
the man. They think, man, I've gotten a man from the Lord. This guy's sent from God. But they don't realize the only one who can solve their problem is the Lord Jesus Christ. The only one who can solve our problem is the Lord Jesus Christ. He fixed our soul at salvation. He'll fix our body at the rapture. And he'll fix the world at the second coming. There isn't a man alive or yet to be born that can fix anything. But that's the first similarity. They're both mistaken as a man from the Lord. Cain and the Antichrist. Cain is a diabolical villain, as they call it. Uh, and he represents the ultimate villain, the Antichrist. The next thing is, number two, Cain is a religious pretender. Cain is a picture of a religious poser. You see, he wanted to offer the sacrifice of his choice. He wanted to do it his way. He was religious, but he wasn't right with the Lord. Just as the Antichrist will be a religious pretender, but it's just for an outward appearance. You'll see in Revelation 17 that he's associated with Mystery Babylon, the Roman Catholic Church. In Revelation 17, 3, John says, So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. The beast is the Antichrist, and that great whore sits on top of him. You see, he, the Antichrist, he's going to be a religious pretender, a religious poser. He'll probably quote Bible verses, but that's just like Cain religious pretender he brought the fruit of the ground he brought a sacrifice notice that he brought the sacrifice before abel brought a sacrifice because he's more religious but the thing is abel's heart was right and his wasn't so it says in genesis 4 3 and in process of time it came to pass that cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the lord this picture is a man trying to appease god by their own fruits he brought of the fruit of the ground. You see, that's what religious people do. If they're sincerely trying to please God, they're usually doing it with fruits, by their own fruit, thinking they can get there their own way. Or they're offering fruits for that outward appearance. Genesis 4, 4 through 5, And Abel he also brought of the first things of his flock and of the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto Abel and to his offering. But unto Cain and to his offering he had not respect. And Cain was very wroth, and his countenance fell. You see, religious people get mean when confronted about their false doctrine. The Lord confronted him here. You know, he had respect to Abel. He didn't have respect to Cain's offering. You see, just attempt to correct any Church of Christ member about their false baptismal regeneration. They're going to get mad. They're going to get very angry. Religious people get very angry. Their countenance will fall. If you got the truth, though, you can be comfortable, comfortable in the truth. In Genesis 4, 6, it says, And the Lord said unto Cain, Why art thou wroth, and why is thy countenance fallen? You see, he's a religious poser who can't stand correction because he's self-righteous. Just like Cain is the religious pretender, so will the Antichrist be. The next thing is, is he rules over sin. Now let me explain. It says in Genesis 4, 7, the Lord says to Cain, If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? You know, bring the bloody animal sacrifice. I'll accept you just like I accepted Abel. You got an equal opportunity. But he says, If thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. Who's the him? Sin. You see, Cain had a free will. He could do well and be accepted. He had the opportunity to bring a bloody animal sacrifice just like Abel did, but he doesn't, so the Lord causes him to rule over sin. You say, well, what do you mean by that? Well, that's a worse fate than sin ruling over you. You see, the power to do any sin you please is a much worse fate. For example, take the rich and famous. It says in 1 Timothy 6, 9 through 10, But they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. Notice that word perdition. 
that's associated, that word is associated with the Antichrist. He's the son of perdition. It says, For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. You see, a man can have so much power, so much money, so much fame, that not only does sin control him, but it gets to a point where he rules over sin. You see, he has the power to commit any sin that he wants to and do it in any excess that he wants to. He will have all the money, all the drugs, all the women. The Antichrist will have anything he wants. He'll rule over sin. He will be king over a kingdom of darkness, as it says in Revelation 16, the Antichrist kingdom. He will have any sin at his fingertips. He rightfully has the name Man of Sin. In 2 Thessalonians 2, 3, he is called the man of sin. He's called the son of perdition. He's going to have so much power. He'll be able to do anything that he wants. Any sin that he wants will be at his fingertips. Anything. Whether that be sex, drugs, uh, sex trafficking stuff, being a child predator, homosexual stuff, anything. He'll be able to have it with a snap of a finger. You know, that's a much worse fate than your drunk on the street. You see, that drunk, he's controlled by sin, but he doesn't have the power to do any sin that he wants to. He may not even be able to do his favorite sin that day if he doesn't have any money. But that's not the case for the Antichrist. So, Cain rules over sin. The Antichrist is a man of sin. The next thing is, Cain is a murderer. In Genesis 4, 8, and Cain talked with Abel his brother. And it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and slew him. You see, Cain murders his brother with ease. This pictures the religious crowd killing the Bible-believing crowd. This pictures the religious crowd killing Jesus Christ. This pictures the Antichrist murdering the true saints during the tribulation time period. It says in Revelation 13, 7, And it was given unto him, the Antichrist, to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. He's going to have all, all the power you can have on this earth, that is. You see, Cain is a murderer who is led by that wicked one. And the Antichrist is a murderer who gets his power from the dragon, that old serpent himself. In John 8, 44, Ye are of your father the devil, and lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. Cain was a murderer. And this is a really significant one here. Cain was of that wicked one. Look at 1 John three twelve. It says, Not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother. And wherefore slew he him? Because his own works were evil, and his brother's righteous. This is significant. Do you know what it calls the Antichrist in 2 Thessalonians 2 8? It actually calls him that wicked. He's that wicked, and his name is that wicked. It says in 2 Thessalonians 2 7 through 8, for their mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until, until he be taken out of the way. And then shall that wicked, capital W, be revealed. Whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Cain is of that wicked one. And the Antichrist is called that wicked. Now the next thing, Cain is a liar. In Genesis 4.9, and the Lord said unto Cain, Where is Abel thy brother? And he said, I know not. Am I my brother's keeper? Now note the way he talks to God. Sounds kind of blasphemous, doesn't it? He's kind of being smart aleck, smart alecky here to the Lord. He said, Am I my brother's keeper or something? That's the way the Antichrist is going to talk. In Revelation thirteen six, it says, And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God, to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. I mean, he's going to be a smart aleck, blasphemous liar. In Genesis 4.10, it says, And he said, What hast thou done? The voice of thy brother's blood crieth unto me from the ground. 
That's what the Lord said to Abel. And the thing is, another similarity is that the Antichrist victims will also cry out. In Revelation 6, 9, and 10, it says, When he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? You see, the Antichrist, he's going to have a lot of Bible-believing victims that he kills, and they're going to cry out from below, just like Abel. Abel's blood cried out from the ground. Both the Antichrist and Cain have victims that cry out to the Lord from the ground. The next thing, both Cain and the Antichrist are deceivers. In 2 Thessalonians 2, 9 through 11, it says, Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, that's the Antichrist, with all power and signs and lying wonders, with all deceivableness of unrighteousness and them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion, that they should believe a lie. So he's going to be doing all these powers and signs and lying wonders. He's going to send us, there's going to be a strong delusion from the Lord, and people's actually going to believe this guy. And see, you know, Cain, you know, he was basically living a double life. You know, his parents probably had no idea. Abel may not have even had no idea that he was about to be killed and that Cain had all this murder in his heart. They're both deceivers. This is a, another really significant one here. Both of them are punished greater than he can bear. In Genesis Genesis 4.12, the Lord's talking to Cain, and he says, When thou tillest the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength. A fugitive and a vagabond shalt thou be in the earth. And Cain said unto the Lord, My punishment is greater than I can bear. So Cain believes he's got a punishment greater than he can bear. That's exactly what the Antichrist is going to have. In Revelation 19.20, it says, And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire burning with brimstone. You see, Cain believes he's punished greater than he can bear, and the Antichrist is definitely punished with a punishment greater than he can bear everlasting fire everlasting torment is what the antichrist will be punished with something else is cain's a tiller of the ground the earth you see what's the antichrist all about the earth the next thing is they're both associated with the mark genesis four fifteen. the lord said unto him therefore whosoever slayeth cain Vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord set a mark upon Cain, lest any finding him should kill him. So the Lord puts a mark on Cain, some type of mark, to where he's not going to be killed by people. That's like what the Antichrist is going to bring. He's going to be associated with a mark. Revelation thirteen seventeen, And that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. So if you don't get this mark and worship the beast, you're going to be killed. So the mark that the Antichrist puts upon you will keep you from being killed temporarily. It'll keep you from being beheaded temporarily. Taking the mark and worshiping him will keep you alive for a while. And um, just like Cain, Temporarily, you know, he eventually died, obviously, but temporarily he's kept alive, kept from being killed because of a mark that the Lord put on him, both associated with a mark. Romans 9.22 says, What if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction? You see, God will, will take a, a, a wicked man and that man's vessel becomes a vessel of wrath. And he'll allow that man to be wicked and do what he wants to do. Kind of like he did with Pharaoh. Like he's going to do with the Antichrist. Like he did with Cain. And he'll let that guy do what he wants to do. Just so that the Lord can show his wrath side. 
You see, you got to have a villain. You got to have a Bible villain so that your wrath can be shown. If it wasn't for these villains, God wouldn't be able to show you all of his power. But he's going to show his wrath through Cain. He's going to make his power known through Cain. Just like he does with the devil, just like he does with the Antichrist. So you need a villain so that the real hero can show you his powers. Genesis 4.16, And Cain went out from the presence of the Lord and dwelt in the land of Nod on the east of Eden. So he left the presence of the Lord. And now, another one is he's a counterfeit. Something about the Antichrist is that he is a counterfeit of Jesus Christ. He wants to be worshipped. He's going to claim to be God. He's going to have a white horse. He's going to die and resurrect. You know, trying to copy the Lord. Something you'll notice about Cain is that the men from his line have similar names to the men in the promised seeds line. Look at this in Genesis 4, 17. And Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bare Enoch. And he built a city and called the name of the city after the name of his son, Enoch. Now pay attention. That's not the same Enoch as you read about in chapter 5. That's not the same Enoch who walked with God and was not, for God took him. So obviously the devil is trying to make his line look like the line of the promised seed. Or the line that will be the promised seed. And he's copying the names. It's a counterfeit. In Genesis 4.18, And unto Enoch was born Irad, and Irad beget Mahujael. And Mahujael beget Methusael. And Methusael beget Lamech. Now Methusael, that's like Methuselah. And Noah's father is also named Lamech. But these are not the same men that you see in chapter 5 and chapter 6. This is Cain's line. A wicked line. And it's a, he's, it's a counterfeit. See, they both counterfeit. Cain is a counterfeit. The Antichrist is a counterfeit. Genesis 4, 19 and 20. And Lamech took unto him two wives. This is the Lamech from Cain's line. The name of the one was Ada, and the name of the other, Zillah. And a Ada bare Jabal. He was the father of such as dwell in tents, and of such as have cattle. And these are your first cowboys here, of such as have cattle. Probably, probably the, the Kid Rock kind of cowboys. Rebels. Uh, something you need to also notice is that Cain is the first city slicker. In Genesis 4.17, it says, And Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bare Enoch, and he built a city. He built a city and called the name of the city after the name of his son, Enoch. Not the same Enoch, though. It's not a big secret that things are mostly sinful in the city. I mean, they call Las Vegas Sin City. You see, especially big cities. It's more sinful than, you, than it mostly is back in the country. I mean, I'm sure there's exceptions, but for the most part, there's a lot of sin going on in big cities. And through television, music, movies, social media, and things like that, the city has made its way to the country. Now the country boy, he's got much, just as much exposure to sin as the city boy. But remember how Cain was told he would rule over sin? Well, he's doing just that. He's probably got his own little sin city that he's over here. And it's true that when someone gets out into the big city and they see the flashing lights, the billboards, the traffic lights, the skyscrapers, the vehicles, the police lights, ambulances, and fire trucks, and all these things going on, that can cause a person to focus on this present evil world and they just forget about God altogether. Those flashing lights and street lights and traffic lights kind of drown out those greater lights in the sky. Those big stars up there that remind you of a creator. And all you think about is what you see down here, the work of men's hands. You just, that spirit of Cain and that spirit you get when you go into big cities many times makes you forget about God. And I know Cain didn't have all that stuff, but there's nothing new under the sun. I'd say after a while that city spirit caught up with Cain so much that he forgot all about the Lord. 
But something else, musical instruments. Something else about Cain's line is that they seem to be the first one to use instruments, at least that we read about in Genesis 4.21, and his brother's name was Jubal. Now, well, that's the one that's like Jubilee. Uh, he was the father of all as such as handle the harp and organ. And Nebuchadnezzar, another type of Antichrist, also makes use of instruments. In Daniel 3, 5, uh, when he wants people to come worship the image, he gets uh, all these instruments, the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sackbut, the psaltery, the dulcimer, and all kinds of music. He's like, when you hear that, you fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar has set up. It wouldn't seem far-fetched that music will be a huge part of the Antichrist kingdom. And I, I'm always reminded when I read this of like when I've seen Obama first come on the scene, he was getting all these rappers to come walk with him like ludicrous. And he mentioned that he was a big fan of Jay-Z and Kanye West. And I'm thinking, I was just really young at the time. And I'm thinking, I don't feel comfortable having a president that listens to rappers who talk about killing people and drugs and sex and all that kind of stuff. But this country is going to get what it deserves, right? It wouldn't seem far-fetched that music will be a huge part of the Antichrist kingdom and his, you know, the way he gets things done and gets people to listen to him. The next thing is, is this line, Cain's line is associated with iron. In Genesis 4.22, And Zillah, she also bare Tubal-Cain, an instructor of every artificer in brass and iron, and the sister of Tubal-Cain was Nama. You see, iron is associated with the Antichrist and is also usually negative in the Bible. For example, in Daniel 2, 41 through 43, you've got iron mixed with miry clay. That's what you're going to see in the tribulation, iron mixed with miry clay. In, Dan uh, in Deuteronomy 3, 11, the giant King Og has a bedstead of iron. He's a wicked king. He's got a bedstead of iron. In Deuteronomy 4.20, Egypt, Egypt is likened to an iron furnace. In Deuteronomy 27.5, it says, And there shalt thou build an altar unto the Lord thy God, an altar of stones. But watch this, thou shalt not lift up any iron tool upon them. In Deuteronomy 28.47-48, it says, Because thou servest not the Lord thy God with joyfulness, and with gladness of heart for the abundance of all things. Therefore the shalt thou serve thine enemies, which the Lord shall send against thee in hunger, and in thirst, and in nakedness, and in one of all things. And he shall put a yoke of iron upon thy neck, until he have destroyed thee. In Joshua seventeen sixteen, the Canaanites, the enemies of God's people, they have chariots of iron that made them stronger. When Solomon was building the Lord's house, it says in 1 Kings 6, 7, And the house, when it was in building, was built of stone, made ready before it was brought thither, so that there was neither hammer, nor axe, nor any, nor any tool of iron heard in the house while it was in building. How about that? In Job 40, 18, Behemoth's bones are, bones of, are like bones of iron. Iron's associated with the shadow of death in Psalms 107 and verse 10. So iron, associated with Cain, associated with the Antichrist, usually negative in the Bible. And another thing, Cain, he killed Abel, obviously, and he had his crosshairs on the promised seed. You see, the promised seed is supposed to come through Abel. It says in Genesis 4, 23 through 24, And Lamech said unto his wives, Ada and Zillah, Hear my voice. Ye wives of Lamech, hearken unto my speech, for I have slain a man to my wounding and a young man to my hurt. You see, Cain has murderers in his line. And the Antichrist, he's going to hang her, all he's going to have is a bunch of murderers around him. And it says, If Cain shall be avenged sevenfold, truly Lamech seventy and sevenfold. This is where the wicked rock band Avenged Sevenfold got their name from. And Genesis 4.25, And Adam knew Eve his wife again, and she bare a son and called his name Seth. For God said, She hath appointed me another seed instead of Abel. You see, Cain had his crosshairs on the promised seed, just like the devil and the Antichrist did. 
will. So it says in verse 26, And to Seth, to him also there was born a son, and he called his name Enos. Then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. You see, Cain slew Abel. The devil thought, well, I've got that promised seed out of the way. It's not going to bruise my head because I've killed Abel. Now the promised seed can't even be born. So he thought that he had won. That's just like when Jesus was crucified. They thought they had won. Just like Abel was slew, the devil thought the problem was solved. But you see, the Lord always makes a way. He gives Adam and Eve Seth, and the promised seed will carry on through him. Just like the Lord Jesus Christ comes back again. And you see, the Lord's always got a way. Jesus died on the cross, was buried and resurrected, and he's coming back again. They just thought it, they got him out of the way. And this time they won't be able to crucify him again. But within this study, if you paid attention and took good notes, then you've just studied an entire chapter. You've studied around 60 verses. You've done a character study on Cain and partly on the Antichrist. Uh, you've learned about the three applications of Scripture, and you've learned about some Bible topology. And the goal of this study was to make you feel like you've just opened up your Bible and had a fresh meal. And you did this all within about 36 minutes. So my plan is to keep doing these, Lord willing, and continue with this series on Bible villains within this series of studies about, you know, of fighting the famine. And... Uh, the plan is to have you a lot of Bible-believing material to soak your teeth into at least every other day. That way you can get on here and always have something to get into. Just get in the Bible, open up your Bible, take notes in your Bible, and just become a Bible student. 